hello, those of you who are joining us. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath, you probably knew that, and uh, welcome to a Friday Fireside Chat. Uh, just to make sure you're aware, this is being recorded, um, and so don't say anything you don't want your grandmother or reporters <laughs> at the New York Times to know. <laughs> keep, keep the private stuff private. Um, I guess this week is Tiffany Bova, the Chief Growth Evangelist at Salesforce, but more importantly for our conversation, the author of this brilliant new book, of which I've actually acquired a plethora of copies, <laughs> The Experience Mindset, um, Changing the Way You Think About Growth. Uh, so Tiffany's a dear friend. We go back a ways. I think we first met, was it at Thinkers 50? That we it first was. Met? I think it was. But I can't remember whether it was that or business of software, but I think it was Thinkers 50. Um, and she's one of the few kind of out and out practitioners on the Thinkers 50 list, which is uh, much to her credit. Um, but she's done a whole lot of stuff in her life. So maybe Tiffany, start off by just telling us a little bit about your journey and, and how you got to be where you are. And I'd also love to know about like why you wrote a second book when you found writing the first one so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I've been in and around tech. First, let me say thank you, Rita, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Look forward to the conversation and the questions. Um, I've been in tech now almost 30 years. I know I look 36, but I started young. They uh, do in tech, right? <laughs> right. In tech years, I'm, I'm young. Uh, but uh, it was an accident that I landed in technology. I started out as an individual quota-bearing sales rep and then sort of moved my way up. And then I started running sales teams and then I got a little more expansive and I started running marketing and customer service teams um, really early in what then was called the World Wide Web. Um, it was not yet called the cloud. So back in 2000, I was a Loquas beta client. I was constant contacts beta client. Um, we were doing things like virtual private servers and infrastructure as a service and software as a service. It just was not called those things. Uh, yet, and nor was the technology as advanced, obviously, as it is now. Uh, but that gave me a bird's eye view on seeing how this transformation and the usage of tech was going to be really different. But it also showed me the pace by which this ever running train was going to continue to accelerate. Uh, so I burnt out a little bit um, and, and changed roles and, and finally finished sort of my leadership sales, marketing, customer service at a Fortune 500 company. For those of you re that remember Gateway Computers, I ran a division of Gateway. The, 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 the cow people? The cow people, yes. <laughs> so That's awesome. Uh, the, Hol the Holstein pattern boxes to be narratively brand correct. Okay, yes. got it. <laughs> uh, but yes, the cow boxes. Um, and so I ran a division and built that to about a, about a $285, $290 million business. Um, right when the stores closed. So it was Gateway used to have stores across the US. Um, it was pre Apple stores. So I was reading something on Twitter yesterday that, you know, like Apple created the category of having, you know, PC and computer stores. And then Microsoft took it. I'm like, and I'm like, correction, Gateway had it. Apple copied it. Then Microsoft copied it. But anywho, um, then uh, I spent a decade as a research fellow at Gartner. Uh, which is the world's leading analyst and consulting firm for tech, advising on go-to-market, sales strategy transformation, the impact of digital. And it gave me an even broader perspective because I had been working in a company, not looking more from the outside in across multiple companies. And that's really where I found my love for what I get to do now. Um, did that for a decade. And then about seven years ago, Salesforce came along and said, hey, we'd love to create a position for you to continue doing what you were doing uh, at, at Gartner, but do it for us and for our clients. And lo and behold, now I've been here seven and a half years, written two books, uh, been on the Thinkers 50 list twice and friends with Rita. That's all that matters right there. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so <laughs> awesome. I'd forgotten about the gateway thing. Wow. And they used to be such a presence. Um, just amazing. Well, we, you know, what, what was fascinating that, that, that was a lesson in, and I really should write this up. Maybe we do this together, Rita, but it was too early. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, we had tablets, we had all in ones, we had something that we didn't call it a genius bar, obviously, but the customer at that time tended to be not a household, but a man who was very technically inclined. 
so there wasn't a desktop in every house or in every kitchen counter or in every purse or in every, right? And so it was a very specific target market. Then they had very specific needs. And so it was interesting to see that we just, we just were too early, if you will, for the consumer broad market. Um, but, you know, had we hung, and it was like a six or $7 billion business. Uh, it was bigger than Dell. Uh, and then it wasn't. <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's how it happens. That's that whole transient advantage thing. It'll come to grab you. Well, it's like my experience with Nokia. So it was about 2004 and I was up in Ulu or somewhere in Finland, um, literally holding in my hands a flat device that it used a stylus. It wasn't a touch screen, but it connected to the internet and it had like applications that ran on it. It was basically an iPad um, in 2004. You know, for like seven years before Apple came up with something similar. Yeah. Um, and so they just, they invented it. They spend all the money on the R&D to create it. And then and recalcitrant middle management didn't want to release it to the market. It's fascinating. Anyway, so you have a previous book called Growth IQ. And in that book, you kind of celebrated the hypothesis that if you really focus on um, the customer experience, that you will enable the customers, that, sorry, the companies that did that enabled much more rapid growth than companies that didn't. But you kind of left something out of that book, right? I did. I did. It was uh, Growth IQ was 10 Paths to Growth. And it was a combination of my practicing experience and then 10 years advising you know, startups all the way to Fortune 1 companies. And for those of you who don't know sort of how Gartner works, it, they would do things called inquiry calls. So a customer could call and ask an analyst like me a set of questions. And so I might be on the phone with a startup that says, I'm deciding when I should hire my first sales rep. And then I would hang up the phone and then I'd take another call and it would be like, I'm trying to retrain 30,000 sales reps. You know what I mean? So you would get this spectrum of size organizations, but what was consistent regardless of size or region or industry were these sets of questions. And that led me to say, hold on, you know, I think that there is, um, I think that there are only 10 ways to grow. And I say only kind of in air quotes. That first way was customer experience. But I also found that it was the combination of these growth paths and the order by which you did them that made that more unique, right? So it was sort of the chessboard of what decisions do you make at what time? Like we were just talking about, right? Gateway and Nokia. The sequence was they were very early. The consumer wasn't ready yet. The context of the market hadn't caught up. But in that book, you know, of 60,000 words, I think I mentioned employee like 100 words. I just, <laughs> I just missed it. So um, I had no interest in writing a second book. And then I came to work here at Salesforce. And I had made a comment on stage one day that I didn't think it was a coincidence. Salesforce is a great place to work pretty much globally, um, you know, in the top five. Uh, one of the most innovative companies in the world and the fastest growing enterprise software company. I didn't think it was a coincidence. I said, if it's a great place to work, do we innovate faster? Are we more resilient? Are we willing to go the extra mile for customers? Are our customers happier? Those things are all working in concert. So we're growing faster than the market. Could I prove it? And so that took me down this two-year uh, you know, research project. And lo and behold, we could and then I realized I just really did miss it, right? That I couldn't get any of those growth paths from Growth IQ correct unless the employees came along in this journey. So I had no interest in writing a second book. And then, of course, the experience mindset was born. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and you got Tom Peters to write the foreword, which is quite an accomplishment. And yeah. what, I love is, what I love is how he opened it. Um, he, he opened it with, with, you must care. Yeah, you know, that's... Uh, uh, so many things, um, depending on how you take what I'm about to say. You know, I created a vision board um, many years ago and I put up their, you know, book and I put up there who I wanted as my agent and my publisher. I put the Thinkers 50 list. Um, I put all these things on there and, and I had recently met Tom and uh, he was the very, he wrote, he was a co-author. Um, in Search of Excellence, which was the first business book I kind of ever read, 1982-ish, right? Mm -hmm. My stepfather gave it to me. And when I say I read it, I meant I read the cover. <laughs> I didn't actually read it. I was 16. I wasn't like reading ferociously business books at that point. Um, but I, you know, I started to, I always kept it. It was sort of one of those books I kept because it was sentimental to me. Fast forward in my 20s, I started to read it. In my 30s, I always went back to it. Then I had met him. 
you know, then, you know, fast forward, I've had him on my podcast a number of times. We've done a bunch of things together. And then I asked him to write the forward for my book and he said yes. And he retired right at that time. So I think this might be his very last forward. Um, so the first business book I ever read and then his last forward, it's, uh, there's a lot to be said for sort of putting out in the universe what, what you want to have uh, accomplished in your life and, and having it come true. That's amazing. Yeah, Tom is an amazing guy. I've had him on, I've, had, I've done firesides with him and, and so forth. And uh, yeah, he's, um, he's been a bit of an iconoclast, but, but the emphasis on excellence and the emphasis on caring has been consistent throughout his uh, work, which I think is fascinating. Um, so tell us sort of the core thesis of the book. Like what, what did you really find? Yeah, when we when I made that statement I had shared a few minutes ago, and we went out to start. For those of you just tuning in, the experience mindset, a new way to think about growth. Um, so when we first did the first pass of trying to loosely prove it, if you will, we went to publicly traded companies in the U.S. and we went for publicly available information because that was easier to get. We could look at their customer satisfaction scores, net promoter scores, growth rates, churn rates, retention rates. We would read Glassdoor ratings. Then we interviewed about 300 executives and we got a pretty good sense. We plotted out on a two by two kind of companies that were doing both EX and CX right. Those that were doing so employee experience is EX, CX is customer experience. Ones that may only be doing CX or EX correct, you know, um, doing it really well and those that may not. And we found that those that were doing it really well, both had a 1.8 times faster growth rate than those that did not. So for a billion dollar brand, it would be a $40 million impact. Now, if you're not a billion dollar brand and you're a small business, you can do the math, right? But it's not that you weren't growing if you weren't getting them right. It was a difference of about a low 4% CAGR and a low 8% CAGR, right? So it's not, you're not growing. You're just not getting that multiplier effect. So in that first body, we were able to identify there was some connection but you know, when you go up against an academic, someone like Rita, they're going to look for causation. They're going to look for direct correlation. And it kind of didn't pass the sniff test yet, if you will, um, especially for a CFO or, or academia. Um, but it gave us a really solid starting point. And when we got to the end of that particular body of work, we did it with Forbes Insight. We had this assumption that it was a virtuous circle, right? It was a virtuous cycle that you know, if you get CX right, EX gets a lift, which we saw key performance indicators on the employee side went up slightly if customer experience was high. And the reverse was also true. If the employee experience was high, the KPIs for customer lifted a little bit, but it was when you did both, you saw that multiplier, if you will. So we went into the second research project, which was global. Um, we did it with Edelman. It was much more comprehensive industry, regional slices, size slices. And we started to look for what were the aspects of employee experience that had the greatest impact on customer. I am not an HR expert or a people or a culture expert. So I am talking about literally at the intersection when an employee touches a customer in some way, that interaction, how do we make the employee happier, designing, developing products, answering the phone, selling, servicing, et cetera, so that the customer has a better experience. So when we did that, lo and behold, we were able to find direct connection and correlation between a handful of attributes. One particular study we did with a US-based retailer, thousand locations across the US, they saw a 50-50% increase in revenue per head, per hour, per store employee when they started to focus in on employee experience. That gets people super interested, right? But it is a narrow retail case study. But the thing on the end of that whole body of work was it, it corrected our assumption that the virtuous cycle could go both ways. Happier customer lift employee, happier employee lifts customer. We realized it had to start with employee. That if you started with customer and you had really happy customers, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lift employee. And I could give an example, right? A very large online retailer, you know, out of the US starts with an A, right? Customers are very happy, but you could say in the US right now, employees, not so much so in pieces and parts of their business. So even if you have really happy customers and strong customer experience scores, it doesn't mean your employees are going to come along. 
So in that second body of work, we say pretty emphatically, and I say it in the book, that it has to start with employee. Everything else comes from there. And so that was really where we started to get a lot of traction um, in the market with customers, um, realizing we've over pivoted to customer for the past probably two and a half decades. And the result of that was this unintended consequence that was just cracked open during the pandemic of employees were not happy, great resignation, quiet quitting, dissatisfied. And it should have been no surprise, but we were so customer first, customer centric, customer always that we just really, um, uh, we just always saw that we thought that that would lift it all. But in fact, that was not true. Well, and one of the more interesting sort of analyses that you did in the book is the proliferation of technological tools that we have, which are theoretically supposed to make life better, actually don't. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give an example. You know, I mentioned when you asked me sort of how I got to where I am now that I was very early in the cloud, the Internet, the World Wide Web back then we were really focused on reducing effort for customers. So let me give you an example. Back then, there was no sort of seamless one-click buy, say something, it shows up at your house two hours later. It was a laborious process. It was full of friction. There were lots of steps. And then big design firms like a Razorfish, I'm really going to date myself, would say that, you know, instead of 10 clicks to buy something, it has to be three. Right, that, like that's the magic number, three clicks to buy something and let them out. Now we're down to sort of one click or voice, right? No click. Um, so it was all about reducing effort for customer, which would result in improving the customer experience. But behind the scenes, as we started to drive down, I mean, I lived it, drive down from 10 clicks to three, in the background, humans were running around doing all the things that needed to happen to make the three click actually happen, right? It wasn't automated. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't predictive. There wasn't AI there, you know, there wasn't any of those things commercially available in sort of the consumer space. It might've been happening in labs and things like that, but I'm talking about in a B2B environment. Um, it, it wasn't yet uh, proliferating, if you will. So that very one statement I just made, right? Reduce effort for customer, increase experience. The unintended consequence was the effort for employee went up and their experience went down. And so if you just look at that, let's talk technology. I give this one example. Would you ever ask your customer today to have five tabs open on their desktop or on their phone to place an order? One tab to product search, one tab to pick what you want to buy, one tab to enter the, you know, the credit card information, one tab to place the order, and then one tab to track shipping. And when I say tab, I literally mean, you know, jumping between different websites, quote unquote, or different applications. We would never do that. Like you wouldn't do it for long. Either you'd lose your job or the business would go out of business. But yet we ask our employees to bounce between five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 applications every single day. And that is sort of to the example um, that Rita gave. There was a question here um, from someone that says, uh, let's see, it said, Bogdan, it said, can CX be sustainable with low EX? That example I just gave, right? As employees experience gets less and less, how do you expect your employees to have a smile on their face on the call center, right? It's the 48th call they've taken to do a return that takes 20 minutes. Like how excited are they? How engaged are they? How satisfied are they? How much joy are they finding in their work? Not much. And so it will start to reflect in Maybe they're being short with customers or saying, I'm sorry, I can't help you. There's nothing I can do. I don't know, send an email, but you know, there, there's nothing further. I can't mm -hmm. escalate you. There's no manager. I don't have the ability to do what you want me to do. You have to go do this. You know, those kinds of things, they lose their interest in wanting to go that extra mile for customers. And so that's the risk if you over pivot to customer and leave employees behind. Well, and you've noted that um, how few of the applications that we work with at work are actually integrated. I forget the exact oh. statistic. Yeah, so it's a little more than a thousand. An enterprise has an average of, I think it's a thousand sixty one. Wow. <laughs> applications, and that's enterprise. Now that's all up, right? Supply chain, HR, finance, sales, marketing. I mean, that's everything. And of course, not every employee needs to log in or be, you know, um, able to look at or use a thousand applications. But of those thousand applications, 
only 27, 28, 29% of them are integrated. And so who bears the brunt of that would be employees. And so that example I gave is very true. You know, I work with companies around the world and a lot of what they're trying to do is optimize, right? Increase productivity, do more with less. And they think it's a technology issue. And mind you, it's not lost on me. I know I work at Salesforce, but I believe it's not a technology problem because we have sliced the hair of what an employee needs to do tens of thousands of ways with all these little applications that can do one little piece in part without mm -hmm. integration, the employee is forced to switch toggle between multiple apps, which one study shows wastes about four hours a week, just switching just your switch. brain, switching, not the finger click switching your brain, switching apps and realizing, Oh, I'm at a different interface. Okay. What am I doing? Like, even though you're not aware that multiple seconds of your brain catching up to what your finger just did um, adds up to about four hours a week. So if you want more productivity, if that's your goal, think about the employee experience, look to these integration points and you'll find opportunity for improvement. I love that. Um, the other thing that I think is relevant is that we've done such a good job in many ways of automating customer service experience, right? And there's this metric that I absolutely loathe, <laughs> deep, deep feeling. Uh, it's called containment, which is which is the sale, the service industry's metric for how good your automated service operations are, because containment means you know how effectively did you prevent a customer from actually talking to an employee and i think the trouble is because our customer service software has gotten good enough right that most of the simple stuff we can do for ourselves and we will right so by the time we reach a human being we're already in fit to be tied you know we're already furious we're already in fit. um and i think that's uh, that's something so let's uh, get into some specifics so you talk about the elements of specific customer superior customer experience which i think is really interesting and you notice uh, efficient personalized predictive proactive flexible responsive and uh value based right um and and that's like we would, we would all kind of go not yeah that's what we'd like in a customer experience but you make the point you want your employee experience to be that too <laughs> and yet we don't think about it that way yeah, and this was the whole, this is the whole thing. You know, I was having a conversation with Liz Wiseman, who is, a, a, you know, a friend of both of ours. Um, and that conversation with Liz really solidified. It was before I, I was thinking about writing the book kind of a thing. And I was sharing with her the research and I was kind of tossing out some hypothesis. And I started saying, you know, look, everyone's going, you know, it's customer first and, you know, this kind of first second, which is first, which is second. And we were, discussing. And I said, but I'm worried that that is the wrong approach. She said, because if you get into a first or second conversation, people start saying, oh, it's a land grab. It's a headcount. It's resources. It's budget. It's all those things, that status quo. It's a siloed group. I'm going to own it. I have employee experience. Like that's my remit. That's what I'm responsible for. And I said to Liz, I said, it is not that, right? It's really about having this more holistic experience mindset. And I went, stop, 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 stop. Like, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. And I like, wrote it on a piece of paper and then I wrote it on my whiteboard right here. And I go, that's the title of the book. Uh -huh. because, because at its core, you just said it, Rita, it's when you make a decision or do a journey map or create a KPI, or another comment here was, how do you move employee satisfaction to the top of the board agenda? That you have all these things about customer. All I'm asking is I want an equal for employee. So if you at the board level are tracking net promoter score or customer effort score or customer satisfaction score, or you have a project around personalization and automation for the customer, I want a question asked, what's the correlating corresponding effort and KPI for the employee? So if you have a net promoter score, are you doing ENPS or employee net promoter score? If you're doing customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, customer effort, employee effort. If you're doing churn rate for your customers, are you doing retention rate for your employees? If, you're, if you have a customer advisory board that's telling you something and then that readout goes to the board, is there an employee advisory board that there's then a readout and goes to the board? Because what we found from the research was number one, nobody owns employee experience. So to that the point, no one's talking about it at the board level because nobody owns it. And you may say, well, Tiffany, you just got done saying 
if someone owns it, it's fiefdom, it's silo. And I go, in this case, I need someone talking about it. So just because someone is the person responsible for sharing what's happening, everybody needs to own it. Similar to what we did for customer, by the way, chief customer experience officer or chief customer officer or chief marketing officer may be the person who communicates what's happening at the customer experience layer, but every employee, right, plays a part in that. And it's similar for uh, employees. So nobody owns it. And the second one, which was just completely earth shattering for me. Um, was that we survey our employees, you know, pre-pandemic, let's say it might've been an annual survey or twice a year, or maybe even quarterly, depending on how aggressive your organization is. And more than three quarters of companies do nothing with that data. Now, imagine if you did a customer survey and did nothing with it, because you do a customer survey, everyone's combing through the data, right? What are the customers saying? What's happening? What's going on? And then the employee, it's like, oh yeah, we did the survey, check the box, right? And move on. So you're never going to get it to the board level and be usually because HRs may not be sitting at the board. They may report to the COO, right? They may report into the CEO, but they might not be sitting at the board level. So HR doesn't even have a seat at the table, but many of the things we've just talked about, technology, integration, HR has no zero input on what happens for the call center rep, you know, of how much is being automated before they even get to a human. And then the customer is so upset at the human when they finally get them on the call. HR has absolutely nothing to do with that. So that's why the mindset was really critical um, between um, really trying to balance in a more intentional way, a new operating philosophy for you to work against. Mm. I love that. Well, you, um, I've seen you draw a, like a Venn diagram, which is what does HR own? And, you know, HR owns benefits and medical and retirement and, and that stuff. And what does IT own? Well, they own core infrastructure, da, 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 da. And then maybe there's business heads sort of in the mix there that own like little pieces of, oh, I want this application for my specialized need. Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm experimenting with a no-code platform and I'm creating this other little thing, which just adds to the complexity. And if you sort of map those against each other, there's this empty space in the middle where the employee comes into work in the morning, turns on their machine, you know, and what they're presented with isn't actually designed by anyone in particular for the purposes that they're trying to use it for, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. And one of the questions was, did HR used to own employee experience? And so as we are defining it, so I'll tell you sort of some of the aspects of this, right? It's the people, process, technology, and culture. Their PPT is a longstanding framework. It was, I believe it's diamond uh, model. I think it was from the 60s. Um, and I added C for culture. But if you just think people, process, tech, and culture, what pieces of that does HR own? You could say they've got the people aspect, maybe hiring, who they hire, job descriptions, onboarding, benefits, comp, DE&I efforts, training, all those things, highly important. And I'm not saying it's not important, but not I didn't include it in this book because, as I said, it's really at that intersection right between customer and employee, not all things HR. But when you start talking about process, HR has no line of sight into process of how an employee does their job every day. So, you know, there's a company in Canada I was working with and they were spending their call center agents were spending 20 minutes doing returns. 20 minutes. You could say, does HR have any ability to make that 20 minutes, 10, five, three. No, mm. it was process problem. It was the next one, T, right? It was technology issues. Um, and in a little bit of case, it was also culture. And I'll tell you why. They viewed the call center as a cost center. And so it was being managed by how many heads, how many calls, how much can we automate and all the things we were just talking about versus saying, hold on, it is actually the tip of the spear for customer experience that if we're just driving them through the maze of, you know, a, a, a call tree, right. To try to get to a person. And by the time you get to a person, you're so frustrated that that cultural perspective or view on what the role of a call center is, that's a culture issue. Mm -hmm. You could say HR probably has no line of sight in that. They're not going to go to the CFO and go, don't look at the call center, like a cost center. They're going to be like, why are you in my office? Like, you know, <laughs> out. so anyway, I, you know, I, I would say that this is where HR owns a piece. So one story I give in the book is, look, as I said, Salesforce is a great place to work pretty much globally. We've been around, you know, for 24 years now, a um, little more than 24 years. 
we only stood up an employee experience team less than a year ago. Wow. Yet we're a great place to work. So it means that even mature organizations that are in hyper growth mode or are a great place to work always have room for improvement when it comes to employee. And so we are very focused on certain aspects of it. We did a lot of acquisitions and had a lot of hiring during the pandemic. We had a lot of people on board and not go through our normal onboarding process. So a lot of the employee experience work right now is focused on getting those people who are here, who didn't go through our standard onboarding process through that process, right? Because we couldn't, we just couldn't do it during the pandemic at scale. It, it just wasn't possible. So, uh, well, at least it wasn't possible in the way our culture wants to onboard employees. So let me say that it would have been possible that, but clearly it didn't work well because we needed to go back and, and make it better. So I, so I would say that this is where everybody has an opportunity to put a new lens on when talking about this topic, even if you are a hyper growth company, high performing, you know, your customers are super happy. <clears throat> you're a great place to work. There's always room for improvement. Well, and I'd like to connect what you're talking about here with um, my friend Zainab Tan's work. Um, she's an MIT professor, and her recent book is called The Case for Good Jobs. And like you, she makes the argument that we've got to stop thinking about employees as units of cost only. And that if you think about employees as units of revenue, units of growth, which is sort of the perspective you take here, uh, that it can actually unlock tremendous potential for your organization. Um, and, and I think, you know, what she talks about is she says, you know, companies get themselves into these vicious cycles. And I think you kind of find the same results with the frontline employees, which is, you know, employees aren't happy. So there's a lot of turnover. So there's constant retraining. So there's enormous costs in, you know, refilling those positions and retraining that in effect hurts the customer experience that hurts retention that makes the employee experience even worse. So you get in this like really vicious cycle. Um, and I think you're, I think you're pointing out one pretty key element of it. So Zainab's looking more at structural things like how much do you pay and do you yeah. promote from within and are you cross-trained? Yeah. Uh, but I think you're looking much more granularly at, you know, like what is your day like as an employee? Well, <laughs> and we also looked any... at that though too, because we Did actually we, yeah. said, yeah, we actually said in, in the, you know, we asked in the survey, do you feel like your company is um, uh, preparing you for, you know, work, like training, development, career advancement? Do I feel like, you know, one of the questions was, um, personal growth, like people want to be challenged and inspired and they want to do more. Um, and so that's all part of that employee experience. Do I feel like the company is invested in my success? And one of these sketches that I have in the book, and this is sort of an old adage, it is not mine, right? That you go to the CFO and say, we need to retrain our people and really invest in our talent. And the CFO goes, that's really expensive. I get them certified on all these new things. They're now capable. Now they're much more hireable by other people, you know, and now they're just going to take everything we taught them and leave. We've now wasted that money on them. And the flip of that coin is, well, what if you don't invest in them and they stay? Right. right? So, you know, it is this, this is just about personal, it's, it's about personal development. And if you're a first time manager and you're listening to this, or you read the book at the end of the day, this is where we have opportunity because we have to get a little, you know, very Whitney Johnson, right. Get a little uncomfortable right? We have to, we have to not sit that if you wake up and go to work and you just are very comfortable in what you're doing as a manager, first time manager, long time manager, we're not challenging ourselves. And so at the end of each chapter, I actually have these sort of probing questions, which you can ask yourself, you can ask your team. And that's all part of this personal development and growth that you may come to a different conclusion than I did. Perfect. Great. Love it at least you came to a conclusion, right? I sparked an idea. You went out and went, wait a second, is that really what's happening in my company, right? And then you found, oh, whew, it's not happening or, oh, it is happening, but not to the degree maybe Tiffany mentioned it or Rita was talking about right on the conversation. But it's all about staying curious and having that beginner's mind that we can't have an expert's mind, that the way we've approached things in the past will work tomorrow. We, we need to give ourselves space and time individually to try things that may fail. And that goes to the culture piece. Does your culture reward people trying things? Does your company ask how many projects failed this quarter or they only wanted to know about the wins? If they're only asking about the wins, it's not a culture of learning, right? Because then you're acting like you know, no one's failing. So in your next meeting, ask everyone around the room, 
share one thing that didn't work this week that you did. Like exactly. something that simple, you know, will go a long way to find opportunity for improvement. Absolutely. I find, um, yeah, I, 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 one of my favorite C, CEO questions to ask in a one-on-one is um, I used to work with a guy who would always ask, show me your scrap heap. Like, Every, every one-on-one he ever had. He was like, show me all the things you tried that didn't work out. Because if, you, if you've if you got nothing you've tried that didn't work out, what am I paying you for? You know, to convert oxygen to carbon dioxide? Like, seriously, <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? Yeah, um, and I would say that, that, that listen, when I first got the research, I, I had the opportunity to globally share it in about a hundred round tables or so. And, you know, let's say there was eight to 10 executives. This is over the course of six or eight months. And, you know, it was the chief marketing officer, chief information officer, chief executive, chief operating officer. I didn't have a whole lot of CFOs, but, you know, it was, it was, or it was small business, medium business owners where they wore multiple hats. And the first thing I always heard is if this is so obvious, why isn't everyone doing it? Like, I'm not the first to say happy employee, happy customer, get that right, grow. I am, I am not the first. However, I'd like to believe I'm one of the first to prove the correlation and the direct connection between it and the aspects of employee that have the greatest impact on customer that can have the greatest impact on growth. I'd like to think that. But second thing they'd say is who owns it, which we've already talked about. And the third would be the ROI. If I have a dollar to spend, am I going to spend it on advertising, hiring headcount, product development, employee? You know what I'm saying? Like you have a dollar to spend. I have to retrofit my trucks you know, I have to, like, I have a dollar to spend. And the smaller the organization, those dollars are more precious. In larger organizations, they have much more discretionary funds. They have the ability, they have more assets, they have more access to capital. Smaller you get, they don't, right? Those mistakes get, could be crushing. So it's the right questions. But in my mind, I don't know, Rita, what do you think? I feel like that's that expert's mind. Those three questions to me feel so status quo. Well, they're, they're lagging indicators, right? I mean, yeah. by definition, well you cannot calculate a return on investment until enough time has gone by from the time you made the investment till the time you know what the return is. So it's a lagging indicator. And, you know, it's like running your business by looking in the rearview mirror. And I've argued for years now that what we want are leading indicators. But, you know, another thing that really um, struck me, and you're right, it's not it's not future oriented. They're not really thinking about. Well, it doesn't help them see around corners. That's for sure. It certainly does not. So another thing that really, struck me in the book, and I'm looking here at page 123, is the massive disconnect between what the C-suite and senior leadership seem to believe is true and what their frontline employees seem to believe is true. And so one of the things you write is that uh, 52% of the C-suite believe that the technology that the company provides is working effectively. And that to me is a pretty damning number. I mean, that's just like half. (laughs) So you're spending billions and billions on tech. And like, Half of you believe that it actually is effective. And 32% of the employees believe the technology that provides is working effectively. And this is the one I thought was just an absolute killer. 20% of customer facing employees strongly agree that their company is providing great technology to for that is seamless and helps them collaborate easily easily. I mean, I just think that's damning. And you know. One of the things that I argue a lot is if you're an executive and you want to make decisions, you need to get information from the edges of your company. You know, that that's where big changes that are going to make a difference start to make themselves felt, not sitting in a wrapped package in the boardroom. <laughs> so um, so I think I think that that gap is a, a kind of to me, it's one of the answers to this question about, well, if it's so obvious, why aren't more people doing it? Right. Yeah. And I think that they it while obvious, while really painfully obvious, doesn't mean they know whether it's true in their own organization. I mean, the stat that Rita just mentioned is one that is that I can stop executives in their tracks, right? That 52% of executives believe tech that they're using is working effectively, which to Rita's point means 48% believe it isn't. <laughs> which, what do you do all day? What the are you was, doing, right? <laughs> you know, and, and tech is in every business. You know, it would be different if this was 30 years ago or 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago. But, you know, the smaller the organization, there's kind of less tech, right? There's not a thousand applications, there might be two or, you know, so I get that there are varying degrees of what I'm saying here. The next is like 32% of just the general employee base. So there's a 20% gap between just that group of the C-suite and employees. When you get to customer facing, 20%, believe, you know, that the technology that they're, you know, given allows them to collaborate better and work effectively. 
who is the tip of the spear? Who are the keepers of your customer experience promise? Right. If your company says we are customer centric, we deliver the best service in the industry. We are the ones that go the extra mile. All those taglines. Trust me when I tell you that tagline does not show up to help your customer. That tagline does not show up when something goes wrong. The people do. Mm -hmm. And so it, the employees are the keepers of those customer experience promises, and you're not giving them what they need to be successful. So to Rita's point, the edges, the answers to the questions I raise in this book sit with your employees. But most of the time, leaders all the way up in a big organization in the C-suite don't ever sit in the call center, don't ever go on sales calls. And if you've been sort of listening, you know, I, I do a story at the end of the book, it's kind of ripped from the headlines, um, is we've heard a lot over the last sort of six or seven months of executives, you know, the CEO of Uber driving for a week or this new CEO of Starbucks going and being a barista for two hours. And like, that's some novel idea. Like, yet it is. <laughs> if you think you know what's going on in the business, Undercover Boss in the US anyway, right, is a perfect masterclass in the fact that executives don't know what's going on in their business. Because no, in one hour, right, they put makeup on their face so they're disguised to go amongst their people. And I say that's such a waste of expensive television time, no one would recognize them anyway because they never leave their office. <laughs> if they left their office, they would know that the you know storeroom in the back of their retail store looks like you know the Tasmanian devil ran through it and there's no tags on it and they have millions of dollars worth of inventory in the back and that their delivery people are having to lift up boxes. And that's why their health insurance costs are so high because people are getting hurt on the job because they don't have a forklift. How do you not know that? Or that they don't have a point of sale system that actually allows them to do this. Or there's, you know, there's nobody, there's no manager on the, you know, on the premises every day because there isn't enough staff like that. They don't know these things, which either means middle managers are hiding it up the food chain which means they don't culturally feel psychologically safe to do so, or the employees don't care enough to actually tell the middle manager to tell the executive. Whatever the reason, <laughs> this is this managed by wandering around, which was in search of excellence, which was Tom Peters, which is about caring, care enough to go have conversations with your people. And they will tell you those early signals at the edges. They will help you see around the corners. They are not backward looking. They are like, my goodness, I just need to do this in the next hour. I need you to help me do this in the next hour. Like I cannot do this for another day. You've got, you know, they are forward looking. They are not worried about what happened back then. Um, but we just don't spend that time. And that's where I think vulnerability, transparency, uncertainty, um, you know, comfort, you know, beginner's mind. That's where all those sort of soft skills of executives come into play and not everyone is willing to do it. Well, that's true. So I, I will never forget a few um, years ago, there was this big splashy announcement that was made by, I think it was The Gap. Yes, it was The Gap, um, about how they were going to try to give their employees more predictable hours because there'd been a whole lot of really negative press coverage about these workhorse management systems, which yep. sort of bring people in at unpredictable times. And so people couldn't plan their lives, you know, if you're a frontline employee, which is a whole nother topic. But um, but I mean, that's part of it, right? If you if you don't know whether you're opening or closing, you're coming in on Tuesday or Wednesday and whatever, it's very hard to stay focused on the task at hand. But anyway, so um, a reporter went back about three years after this big splashy effort had been announced to sort of see how things were going. And it turns out things were not going very well. And this reporter from the New York Times interviewed these store managers about why, you know, what was going on. And it turns out one huge factor that was causing them to be unable to commit to predictable hours for their employees was store visits by executives. And one of the managers said, completely without any sense of irony whatsoever. Oh yeah, I must have had, you know, three crews on overtime last year, just getting ready for this visit by an executive. <laughs> so what kills me is even when the executives take the trouble to go to the stores, you know, everybody knows they're coming. And so <laughs> the stores are beautiful. I mean, the store they're walking into has six times the amount of labor hours in it than a typical customer would see. Um, and I think that's just such a marvelous example of, of how you can create these blind spots completely unintentionally. But, you know, and the store managers don't think they're doing a great thing, right? Yeah. And, and I think that let's go back to what if the executive came in unannounced? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just play that out. They came in unannounced and the store was a mess. Would that store manager get fired? Mm -hmm. Maybe. 
undercover boss, if it was an undercover boss, the CEO or whoever the executive was would might go, whoa, what is going on? And might ask, why is the store such a mess? Oh, we haven't had a cleaning crew in like three weeks. So I have to ask people to work overtime to clean the store, right? And the executive is listening. And so if the store manager believes that if an executive showed up unannounced and was going to get fired because they weren't getting supported, that's what happens. They, they, you know, throw all the crews at it. The store looks beautiful when someone shows up because they're trying to go, everything's great boss, right? Because they don't feel safe that they can say, I'm in trouble. Like Mm -hmm. this is a bad representation of our brand. The store is messy. No one's here. There's no one here to help. I'm having to close early because I don't have staff. You know, in the retail business, it's a very transactional, transient industry. There's a lot of part-time employees, not a lot of full-time, long-tenured employees. And so those are the kinds of things that if the culture is like it has to be perfect and you can't look like you're struggling or you need help, that goes back to why I added PPTC and I added the C side of it. Because if we're really going to go down this journey, whether someone had mentioned having titles and moving away from titles, like all that stuff is noise, right? It's about how does everybody, regardless of your title, regardless of where you sit in the organization, feel safe to raise their hand and say, I think we could do something different or better, or I have an idea, or I don't think this is working, or I don't feel like I'm supported, that you don't worry for the ramifications of that. You know, if it's something that's unethical or illegal, like that's a different story. But if it's just, I care enough to tell you, I care enough to tell you that I think the store has been really messy lately because we've lost our cleaning crew. Mm -hmm. I need you to get me some help. Mm -hmm. I care enough to tell you and you do nothing about it. Guess what you've just told me? Yeah. You don't care enough to help me. Right. You don't care enough for, for, you know, to, to reward my initiative. That sends a very different signal, regardless of title. I need help. I think we should should be an open. And that's why that employee advisory board, which was one of the uh, um, pieces of advice I give, recommendations I give in the book, was really to bubble up all these ideas, similar to what we've always done for customer, Mm -hmm. but do it for employee and do it maybe by role or by region or by group or by team. And and then that way you get a really good, to your point, Rita, right, this cross-section of of data points and it gives you the ability to see around the corner and anticipate what maybe employees might need next. Mm -hmm. Um, That kind of commitment to this this mindset um, will go a long way for you to get that flywheel effect of CX and EX working in harmony and, and really giving you faster growth rates. I love that. You know, one of the projects, as you know, that I've been working on is a thing I'm sort of loosely calling the permissionless organization. And, you know, to me, one of the um, things that you're outlining here is if you get employees to, in a situation where they've got the support, they've got the, um, the tools that they need, they know what needs to be done, you really can operate without getting permission from a lot of people. Like if, if you're, you know, if right. you have clarity about the direction and, and you can work, and I actually use Salesforce as an example of a company that's pioneered a lot of these practices, um, you know, it's it, it sort of how that all fits together, right? You're not, you're not, you're not afraid, you're not asking permission all the time. Time. You're not afraid to move. I, I was with a large um, company recently, and they just gotten back their employee engagement, blah blah blah, stores and uh, scores, and very, you know, very financially, very secure company, doing very well, high performance, you know, the kind of place that hires maybe five applicants for every hundred that apply. So really, you know, high talent place, and yet their scores came back. We can't get anything done. It's like, (laughs) we just, it's between the bureaucracy and the tools and one thing or another, we just can't get stuff to happen. And I thought, wow, you know, if a company that's that high performing can report those kinds of results, the average company land on that. Yeah. I I mean, you know, uh, it's not unusual. Like, I think every organization, every employee, all of you watching will see some part of where you work or even yourself in the book, because Mm -hmm. it's not that it's bad. It's that it's just a blind spot in totality. It's definitely a blind spot, but in pieces and parts, you might be doing really well. And in other pieces and parts, you may not be doing well. It's, you know, I often get asked what companies are doing really well with the experience mindset. It's like, well, in a point in time, I can say this one, but that doesn't mean next week they wouldn't have gone left. And so, you know, the CEO gets on a zoom and fires everybody like, 
then something, okay, then not so great, right? So there are moments in time where they're better than other moments in time. It's that, are we striving towards being better? And, and over time you get the collective goodness of, of those things. Um, and, you know, I think some companies will say, look, Salesforce, 24 years, billion dollars in revenue, fastest growing. We've introduced it. We started with one aspect, onboarding and training of new hires. Like it wasn't this big bang effect. So you can start by a group, by a team, by a division and really start to try to learn what pieces and parts. It, it, it can start small. It can start from the bottom. It doesn't have to start from the top. I actually like it better when it starts from the bottom. Um, and really look for ways of people who are willing to do the work. Um, someone else said something about incentives. Incentives is maybe tucked under culture, but here's what I'd say there is that we've seen through research, not this research, but we've seen some research, maybe Rita, you've seen it as well, that in certain generations, they're willing to take less pay if they agree with the values and vision of an organization. That if they feel personally aligned, that they're willing to stick it out, get paid less, work harder, all of that. So if incentives is the only carrot to get people to do things, then you have a, potentially have a cultural problem. So well, you know, it's, I, it's extrinsic motivation, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying don't pay your people and I'm not saying it's not important. And especially right now when people, it's it's really tough out there, right? Uh, with inflation and the economy and putting food on the table and people are saying, I, I may be quiet quitting, but I need the paycheck, right? So so I understand. Um, but I think this is a this is a journey. This is not a destination. This is constantly whenever something comes up for a new strategy or a new idea, for the customer that you just take a beat and ask what the implications are to the employee and vice versa, that you start having more frequent employee conversations and not get yourself caught in the customer above all else. Um, if that's the one thing you got out of this conversation, then it was a success. If that's the one thing you get out of the book, then that was a success um, to just flip a switch and have this new mindset. And, you know, it, it, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, um, one of the things that I, I love about your approach is that, um, you know, there's always this tendency about they, you know, if only they. And as I've gotten, you know, more advanced in my career, so the people that I interact with, they're sort of climbing up the corporation. It's just a function of age, I think. And so I'm talking to like CEOs and CEOs are talking about they, like meaning the board. And I'm like, Boy, if you can't fix it, I'm like who can? Um, but one of the pieces of advice that I would suggest, and I'm borrowing a page out of Daryl Rigby's uh, book, um, who's a very well-known consultant at Bain. And uh, he says, you know, you can make wherever you work better. And you can take action on that yourself. You know, find a couple of fellow travelers who share a perspective on something, pick a problem that you think is worthy of uh, your attention and, you know, take an hour a week and, and, and see what you can do, see what creative responses you can do. And you can start to create, you know, making it better, um, yep. in, you know, in a way. There was a question here about, have you seen examples where EX started small and grew across big organizations over time? Yeah, that's not what I was saying, right? Where you just, if you're, if you're a manager, first, le first level manager, and you've got five people, like start with your team, ask them questions. What's the one thing I could move out of your way to make you more productive today mm -hmm. across people? So it could be collaboration, process, fix a process, tech, uh, or something more broad. Mm -hmm. um, but ask one question and then start working through it. Start working through it. Um, like I said, from the bottom up um, is, is really impactful. But before we end this, I want to say hi to, um, I want to say hi to, to somebody who just said hi to, to us both. Um, Surrender, if you're still in Hawaii, aloha. I say hi to you. He was a client um, uh, and became a really good friend, worked at Cisco for many years. So I'm glad he jumped on and joined us. Uh, I think he's now just hanging out in Hawaii, which is a great thing to do. Um, well, hi, Surrender. Nice, nice. Yes. To join us and uh, nice for everybody else. So I always like to um, sort of get a sense for how people can learn more. How can they engage? So you're very involved in in you know, in your in your day job, uh, evangelizing for Salesforce around the world. And I'd love to learn uh, maybe one or two things you think other companies might learn from Salesforce, and then how people can get smarter about some of the other activities that you're involved with. Well, I'm pretty active on social. You can uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I don't have any more connections left, apparently. So you can only follow me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm active That's on 30, Twitter. 30,000 people. 
I don't know. I think it's wow. 30. I think the number was 30. I think the number was 30, I thought. But anyway, I, I maxed out a while ago. It, but, you know, I was early in LinkedIn. So, you know, you connected with everyone. And then now I was more discerning and I ran out. So now you can only follow me. Um, and then I have Instagram, um, Facebook, and I have a podcast called What's Next with Tiffany Bova. Um, and then, of course, I've got the I've got the new book out. Um, Experience mindset. I've only got one copy. Rita has two. I feel I have two. I have two. <laughs> somebody, somebody's you know, going to be lucky at Christmas time. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we do, we do a lot of stuff, and and you know, I think that uh, I'm always looking. The questions were fantastic. The comments were fantastic. Um, if I didn't get to it, you know, drop. Well, me what I'll notes. do, what I'll do with the comments is I'll I'll send you a copy, and then if you Amazing. want, we can do a follow up to the ones that we didn't get to um, directly. Amazing. Yeah, and drop me a note on you know LinkedIn if there was anything that you agreed with. Um, but more or more importantly, I'm always interested in the disagreed with because that's where I learn. Um, but if you've got an example of what you're doing in your own organization, I'm always, always looking for great stories. Um, so, you know, I just want to thank you, Rita, for having me today. This was fun. Oh, thank you so much. This was great. And thank you for getting up so early on the West Coast. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> great. Well, enjoy the rest of the weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing you next.